and said, hey, I'll tell you what, um, instead of Wi-Fi and stuff, you know, you've got free connectivity internally, you've got access out on, on, uh, on, on Wi-Fi, and you only have to, if you want to, it may not be necessary, to subscribe to a GSM operator for, for the occasional, you know. Um, I just wonder whether those hard handset manufacturers are potentially big allies for this. Here, here's another bit of prehistory. That idea was actually introduced by the Japanese in the early 1980s. It was called the Personal Radio Service. It was sort of like a cordless phone, but instead of connecting to your own base station, it could connect to anybody's base station. And the cellular industry, which was just getting started at that time, did everything they could to stop that from spreading out of Japan. At its peak, they were selling 50,000 units a month in Japan. You know, and now it's being barely left. I think, but I think you made a really important point there. Why are the handset manufacturers colluding with the operators? Well, because it's a, it's a, I mean, I mean, it, you know, that's a, 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 a rhetorical question. But I think the, the landscape is changing yes. up to the point where the handset manufacturers yes. need to start colluding with their customers <coughs> as opposed to the operators. And we're beginning to see that, I think, with, uh, with the operating system like, like yeah. Android. And, uh, Tomorrow you're going to hear from, from Paul, who's doing something very similar to what you described. Yeah, I think we are at a sensitive tipping point because at the moment um, they know what's on the other side of the chasm. They've got to generate this quarter's earnings for their shareholders. They can only do that reliably by going with the customers they've got. But I think that they are potentially um, more actively looking at the radar screen for an alternative strategy, direct market strategy. And we shouldn't miss that. That's right. and yeah, I think in actual fact, you are spot on. And you think that when will the day come? The day was last week. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, um, a handset manufacturer um, actually approached myself for the Cell project and said, we want to put door mesh software on every phone we manufacture. Yeah, um, and we obviously, they're still in the process of working through how that will pan out. But they are very keen to do that. And what you can then start to do in terms of releasing more low-powered spectrum mm. into that environment, that becomes a very powerful yeah, people push argument, isn't it? This, this is exactly the point of crossover from my interest in spectrum to community yeah. networks. Because if you, if you imagine a future where radio really is ubiquitous, yeah. uh, then the rules have to change, obviously. If, if, if you have radio being ubiquitous and the meter is running every second of your life, well, the operators would love that kind of situation, but the alternative is that you don't need operators. Absolutely. <coughs> so yes, tomorrow at 10 a.m. is the Sir Vault project. Uh, we'll be having a session, so if you're interested in this, I definitely recommend there. I also want to point out, uh, you know, OLSR folks hacked the, uh, the Android phone, the iPhone to do meshing Gosh, and it's been about two years, I think, that they started doing that. And so you can see sort of the, the way that this has progressed. The third project I want to point to is the Open BTS, David Burgess and his folks, which is DIY GSM, do-it-yourself GSM systems. Turns out you only need, you know, not nothing but a few thousand euros, and you can start setting up a city-wide cellular network that can plug directly into, say, an asterisk voice over IP server. And uh, reduce the fact that you're using a million dollar spectrum license. And then, yes. <laughs> so, so now you're getting back to exactly what my question is. So, for you guys, what are the barriers and why are we seeing the retardation? If the technologies are there, what are the barriers that are keeping these things from actually being uh, deployed widely? And clearly, licensure is probably the number one. Well, I think that's clear, right? It's, it's a huge, huge business. Interest. Yeah. It's just keeping those closed uh, walled garden uh, environments around, uh, creating artificial scarcity. Uh, I mean, that's just uh, that's just a classical business approach. Um, but, but coming back to how, how we could change it, I think the iPhone is a, is, a, is a marvelous example. There are others. But once you have a technology in place that's in, used by millions of people, you can put a lot of pressure on regulators. If you're talking about more efficient use of spectrum and not allowing analog transmission 8 megahertz wide in, in, in the, on the 2.4 SM <coughs> band, I think if the, I think already now, this is a minority, 
uh, it's really inconvenient if it happens in your neighborhood. But uh, I think if you have millions or billions of Wi-Fi uh, devices out there, it shouldn't be too hard to pressure regulators to say, okay, uh, you have to be a good citizen in those ISM bands. Uh, and to come back, actually, uh, uh, I had that in mind before you came with that line about smoking. It's, it's, it's like, okay, I cannot smoke in here because there are other people in here who want to have fresh air, right? You can smoke outside, right? So uh, you have to be a good citizen. If you, if, you have to you have to have, if you have to share a common resource with others, you have to be a good citizen. You cannot be too egoistic and selfish. And uh, I think that's something that you can also convince politicians of. Like the smoking. So are, like are, are you talking about getting manufacturers to be good citizens? Or are you getting talking about well, users to be good citizens? The, the users have no pull that spectrum. They just switch it on and use it. So you have to, you have to uh, convince uh, regulators, politicians, and just impose certain rules. Not, not too strict, but certain rules about, OK, if you want to use this common spectrum, you have to adhere to certain you know, cooperation standards, not interfering with others, not taking away other spectrum, other people's spectrum unnecessarily. I, I think that should be possible. You, you glossed over that, that point about the, the user is not, you know, they just turn around and just use it, they're not, you know, they don't know about spectrum. And um, you know, I think that that's an important point. You know, you said that it's, it's you know, big, the board's big uh, business, business interests. But you know, when you say that, that also points out the lack of the human user voice isn't there. And uh, you know, like like Steve, I think, you know, I'm just trying to spectrum policy um, as sort of like a subset of uh, information and communications policy. And wondering as we've got this wonderful history, you know, that's been talked about and we've changed ideas about like why aren't cell phone users and internet users that sort of acted as in the way that ham users were, you know, in that in initial wave of the spectrum, um, you know, spectrum hacking, spectrum policy hacking. So my personal experience is, for example, um, about 10, 10 or 15 years ago, people buy a cordless headphone with one of the affordable first women. And then they started selling all kinds of devices, all transmitting at home with your three networks. So you always had the noise in the headphone. So people started to purchase devices that were running at 800 69 megahertz. And now they put it into 869 megahertz. Well, then the band is overcrowded and they look for 2.4, but 2.4 is already overcrowded. So it's, it's always the same way. They experience producing devices for a certain spectrum or for a certain band. And then it becomes so crowded, and then there's a demand to buy new devices and operate in yet another band, which is still not overcrowded, but is becoming overcrowded, which creates again the again the need to purchase new devices. That's not happening. No, but it doesn't have to be that way. You're looking at a time when now we take for granted that in the ISM band, or Jen, let's, let's speak of 2.4 specifically, um, that if you if you can offer uh, Wi-Fi, then you can offer baby monitors and cordless phones as well. It wasn't that way before 1989. The FCC speci specified what applications could run in the ISM band, and it wasn't until 89 that they generalized it. They said, look, you can do anything you want as long as you meet these technical criteria. You know, it's possible to go back to a time where you specify only voice applications in this band, only data in this band. We can do it. It's a, it's a policy hack. It's up to us. I'm sorry, my question is like it's, a, it's like the government which allows for people to gather freely as long as you're all speaking more than a phone booth. You can hold a demonstration and a meeting as long as the kids in the phone booth. And everybody can go and use their telephone to have several different demonstrations at the same time. That's what we have. So, Alexia, if you were in charge, what would you do? Well, allocate more spectrum to those devices. So, which spectrum? 2.5 gigahertz? No, no, no. Um, at 800, um, at the moment, for example, 869 is just, I think, 1 or 2 megahertz. I think, I, I think there's no reason not to have 100 megahertz, for example. Uh, except in, in Africa, those are all CDMA networks. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
and that's the challenge, is that it's never the same anywhere, right? Yeah. So, uh, well, so, well, 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 so, gazes on the regulators and decision makers themselves. But let's first get to Paul, right? So basically, my decision is a direct follow-up from the previous comment that when regulators look at two things, we ultimately we're looking at it, public interest in whatever particular perspective they see that. And so broadcasting provides you know, a convenient way to get some of your total value out in television or whatever. But they want to make sure that any other uses of the spectrum that might impinge on that, A, don't impinge on it, and B, are justified by a sufficient use case. And the liberalisation of the mobile phone bans is very problematic in this case because the telephone carriers have monopoly. It's actually incredibly impossible for us to develop applications that are compelling, that are citizen generated in that space. So I think that, I'm not sure what the state is in the, um, in the US, but in Australia there's no minimum experimental power level. So if I were to transmit one nanowatt at 900 and whatever megahertz, and I would be in breach of um, you know, Commonwealth law in Australia. I think it's actually technically the same in the US and a number of other countries. So I've been Hunting around to try and find what I'm increasingly thinking about is you know, a spectrum reserve, a place where you can go and find wild, untamed spectrum. <laughs> and, and you can try all these things out. Um, and I, I think I've actually found a place where that could be done. The question is how useful it could actually be. Um, I mean, ultimately, it needs to be somewhere that's actually sufficiently remote that you can't claim that you're going to impact on anyone at all. Um, just a convenient little island off of Australia and not Tasmania, it's a small one. Um, that meets this criteria and their telecommunications community is actually quite excited about the idea of getting um, research and development activities happening there because the economy is fast in case being in population 2000. Um, so I think that's a, a concept. I'm not sure how effective it would be if we can generate compelling use cases in some kind of reserve, but that might help to tip the balance in terms of the, the policy makers. So let's, let's talk about regulators. And, and what the hell is wrong with these people? And to, to illustrate, uh, I'm going to give, actually I'll first give you uh, three A's that will make you a spectrum expert, and then I'll give a quick story to get us started on the beatdown we're about to deliver. Three A's that will make you a spectrum expert. If you look at just about any country on Earth, and you look at what's called the allocation chart, and this is what, what is the use for a piece of spectrum? FM radio, television, cell phones. When you look at the chart, it's completely full. Everything's been allocated. You say, like, oh, there's no space here. The second A, which is the assignment. So this is what station is in a particular band in a particular location. What cell phone uh, tower is in a specific location broadcasting a specific frequency. Um, all these things. If you look at that also, and you were to plot that out, in any geographic area, there's lots of holes in your spectrum chart. Now you look at the third A, which is the actual use. What's actually happening on the ground in places where these assignments have been made within allocated uses? And we actually have data on this. In 2004, a group called Shared Spectrum was part of an NSF, National Science Foundation study, that measured actual use of spectrum in a number of locations around the United States. And the highest usage, the most used place they were able to find was in Manhattan, New York. 
during the RNC, the Republican National Convention. So like Secret Service is out in force, like Treasury Department's out in force, every possible use that you can think to imagine is being used in that location during that point in time. And the highest amount that they found was 13.1% was in use. That's the highest amount in use in downtown New York. And in most places, it's in single digits. So what, when you talk to regulators, and you say, wow, we should really find a way to do this, what they tell you is, oh my gosh, no, no, no. All of these things have already been allocated for various uses. And if you can get through that barricade, and they say, well, you know, we've got all these assignments and people, we've got to have guard bands and yada, yada, yada. And you actually never, almost never get to the actual use question. So and here's where my story comes in. Television web space, which is the unused television <coughs> frequencies. And if you've ever used a little television and gone through the channels, you know that most of the channels are not in use. It's on channel 3, channel 8, channel 22. All those other channels are actually frequencies that aren't being used. In that location. In that location, exactly. And so a lot of people said, hey, you know, there's these great new technologies that could share dynamically access unused frequencies as they move around a neighborhood or the country. And one of the immediate things that we came up against is uh, this notion that unlicensed devices in the television bands would destroy radio. In the United States, we were talking about under 100 milliwatt <coughs> devices, or sorry, destroy television, under 100 milliwatt devices being able to take out 100,000 watt television broadcasting stations. So we battled this out, and they came up with what they, being our opponents, came up with it, what they declared to be you know, sound engineering and clear-cut like, information about why this would destroy television as we know it. And I ended up in a series of conversations with senior Federal Communication Commission staff, including two commissioners, where they told me, the evidence is in, the engineering is very clear. If we allow unlicensed devices in this band, it would take out television stations all across the country. And so I brought up, what about unlicensed wireless microphones? Which are everywhere in this band. There's hundreds of thousands of these unlicensed wireless microphones all around the country in this band and have been operating for decades. And I kid you not, the response, because this is all in the public dockets and so you put in these big papers and analyses. The response was, unlicensed devices other than wireless and microphones would destroy television as we know it. <laughs> and so my question to all of you is, what the hell is wrong with these decision makers that that kind of logic seems to hold sway? Sasha, the, the, the white space devices, to make the transition to Europe, um, is, far, is far worse, actually. Um, an article will be published either later today or, or on Monday. Um, where in policy tracker that talks about the white space report that will be issued in September by the CEPT, the Committee for Electronic uh, Post, European Committee for Post and Telecommunications is producing rules, essentially like the FCC did for white space use of, uh, unlicensed use of TV white spaces. And uh, the report will be a disaster, I think. A lot of people had looked to UHF as a possible new frontier for uh, rural broadband. Um, but the way the um, discussions have played out, uh, it's very much controlled by the broadcasters, and the regulators are very much um, supportive of broadcasting, particularly public.